We good? Okay. If the woman and the man are one, then what independently belongs to me? Nothing. So what you're saying then is this is not my telephone. It's our telephone that I'm the principal user of. So this is, if this is our telephone that I'm the principal user of, then she can come in and take a look at our telephone anytime she wants to and look at anything and I better not bother me. Is that correct? Because it's her phone. I'm just a principal user of it. And so if there's a code on that phone, she better have that code. And I better not be anything on that phone that she does not have access to because that's her phone. I'm just a principal user of it. Is that correct? correct. How about this computer? Who's it belong to? Belongs to us. That's not my computer. It's our computer. So there's nothing on that computer that she should not have access to other than confidential information about a client. Other than that, because that has to be confidential. But other than that, she should have access to anything on that computer. Is that correct? Because that's not my computer. It's our computer. I'm just the principal operator of it. Is that correct? Well, how about my wallet? Who's that belong to? But surely we've got we to draw the line somewhere here, right? I mean, I worked and made that money, right? That's got to be my money. Is that right? No? no. no? What? No. Who's teaching this? Me or you? <laughs> You're right. You're right. It's not my money. It's our money. Regardless of who made it, it's our money. Our money. So all of our money goes together in one place. And we budget where we are going to spend it through agreement on what we budgeted, right? Okay. How about my desk? What if she's going through my desk drawers looking for something? Whose desk is that? That's our desk, isn't it? I'm just a principal user of it. So I shouldn't be angry if she's going through our desk that I'm the principal user of to look for something. Is that right? Because everything belongs to us. Okay. So if everything belongs to us, how about my time? Does my time belong to me or does my time belong to us? So, if I'm going to work, then we've agreed, really, where I'm going to work, where we agreed the hours I'm going to work, and if I'm going to work beyond those, those hours that we've agreed to, what do I need to do? We need to have a conversation, don't we? We need to talk, and we need to come into an agreement. This may be a temporary agreement, because I need to work longer hours. There could be something going on at work, something special going on, a new project, or we could be very deep in debt. So we need to be in agreement on me working these extra long hours, okay? And how many hours I'm going to work. Because my time doesn't belong to just me. My time belongs to us. Her time belongs to, to us also, Okay? How about where I'm going? Is that any of her business? Yes. No? Yes. yes? Everything's her business. That's the other part of me, isn't it? So where I'm going is her business. Who I'm going to be with is her business. What we talked about is her business. How long I stay there is her business. Everything is her business. You know, where I spend the money is her business. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's none of your business. Yes, it is. It is her business. And if it's not her business, we're not one there. We're not in agreement there. And we don't have a trinity here, and we're submitted over here. Things are not going to go well. We'll be arguing about things that's not her business. So anything and everything that belongs to me belongs to her, and everything that belongs to her belongs to me because we're one. Is that correct? So if she starts asking me questions, where were you, and who were you with, and what did you talk about? you just nosy. Is she nosy? No. She's got a right to know. And I need to tell her. Okay? Now, if I got something to hide, we got an issue here. you just nosy. It's none of your business. Everything is her business. And she's not nosy. She has a right to ask. You brought up something when we was downstairs. What if? I remember it now. It's a good question. Because I said that you've got to be willing to sacrifice and give everything up. And Paul asked a question. 
He says, well, what if, male or female, because it could go either way, they ask you to give everything up. All your friends. You can't have any friends. All your extracurricular activities. All your social. Every, well, they say, they're so jealous and so insecure, they ask you to give it all up. What do you think you should do? What do, you, what do you think you should do? Should you give it all up? I think we need a kind of a conversation. This is not normal. Sweetheart, either way, I will temporarily give everything up for you. But it's conditional. Because this is not normal. This is not life. To not have any friends, to not have any hobbies, to not have any outlet other than you is not normal. If you and I will go to counseling to get this worked out, I will give everything up until we do get it worked out. Will you agree to go? You see? So yeah, I would give it up temporarily. Everything. Absolutely anything and everything for my wife. But it's not normal. We need to get this worked out. There's, a, there's an issue here. And, and men are the same way. Sometimes, sometimes men, they just you've got to give everything up. Women, you've got to give everything up. That's not normal. But I will temporarily give it up, okay, until we go to counseling and we get this worked out. Because, you know, we can have issues left over from our childhood where a child had to give, they had nothing. And now it's all about them. And then you've replaced that mom and dad. And they want you to give everything because they had nothing. Or they had to give everything up as a childhood. And so you've you got all these issues left over that shouldn't be there that can be resolved in counseling. You know, even, do you know that even my body does not belong to me alone? And women go, oh, don't talk about that. <laughs> even my body belongs to her. And her body belongs to me. 1 Corinthians 7, 6. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. Now listen to this. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. Agreement. <coughs> and for a time that you may devote yourself to prayer. We're not praying that much. <laughs> then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So even our bodies, not just my possessions, not just my time, my body belongs to her. Remember we said that God withheld Himself from us to not complete us? I am interdependent upon her. She is interdependent upon me. I can hold myself. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I can cuddle, get under the blanket and cuddle. I can have sex by myself. But it, there's somebody that's to complete me. And there's somebody to complete her. My job is to meet her needs. It is not up to me to determine what those needs are. It's not up to me to determine her needs. It's not up to her to determine my needs. We are opposite sexes and we have different needs. Just because I don't have the need that she's had doesn't mean that I should say to her, well, you shouldn't have that need. I don't have that need. Well, here we go. I'm trying to justify not sacrificing now to do something. You see? I, I need to meet her needs and me, me wanting to has nothing to do with this. That's why it's called sacrifice. You're going to hear that word sacrifice often. Because that's, that's how God's love flows. Now, I, I taught something earlier and I didn't finish it about these endorphins. You know, these endorphins caused you to do what you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do it, right? But it was for a selfish motivation. So that you would feel that warm, fuzzy feeling. So that you would feel it. And so now we're doing what we don't want to do when we don't want to do it as a selfish motivation, so you will feel that. But you don't realize that when you are doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it, and you're doing it with the right attitude, you are sacrificing also. You are sacrificing. 
So now you've got a double dose. Not only are you feeling the endorphins, but God's love is flowing through these sacrifices back and forth. You see, you're feeling God's love along with the endorphins. That's what it's about. It's God's way to teach us to sacrifice by giving us this chemical release in these new relationships. So that we will, even if it's for a selfish motivation, we're still sacrificing. We're learning how to do what God wants us to do, to love each other, to get God to the other person. So if I'm sacrificing for my wife, his love's flowing through, through the sacrifice to her. If she's sacrificing for me, his love is flowing through that sacrifice to me, you see. So you've got God's love flowing back and forth between two people. And you've got an endorphin release. <laughs> But like I mentioned earlier, the endorphins stop after about a year. And when they stop, you see no reason to do what you don't want to do anymore. Which means you at the same time stop sacrificing. Now, this is where a lot of people say, I know that you love me, but I don't feel love by you. Of course you don't. God's not in it. God is love, and God's not in it. Okay? You still may have an emotional attachment to this person, but it's not love. You may be staying together for just for the sake of the children or because it's the right thing to do, because this is what you're taught, but it's not love. I can have emotions for her. It doesn't mean that I'm in love with her. I don't want to be alone. I feel lonely without her. It doesn't mean that I'm in love with her, because God's not in it. Because God's got to be in it for it to be love. That's why when somebody's having an affair, says, I'm so in love with that person. No, you're not. You've got an endorphin release. God is not in that, and God is love. That cannot be love because God's not in it. You see? God is not in sin. He's in it, and He'll give you a brand new endorphin release. With every brand new relationship that you have, every brand new flesh relationship that you have, there's an endorphin release. So if you should separate, if you should get divorced, and you meet someone else that matches that picture, you know, we start this endorphin release all over again. You start it all over again. And now you're sacrificing all over again, and you've got endorphins going off, and you've got God's love flowing back and forth. Unless it's an affair, then it's just endorphins. Because God's not in that. Do you see it? Now, love gives. It gives. We're so busy trying to get, we don't give. Well, you don't do this for me, and you don't do that for me. We're so focused on what we don't have, like in the Garden of Eden, that we're not thankful for what we do have. It's so easy to focus on the one or two things that she doesn't do for me. It's so easy to focus on that, instead of everything she does do for me. That's exactly what this guy wants us to do. You know, in the Garden of Eden, they had it all. All, anything they wanted except for one thing. Where did he want to focus? Well, you can't have that. God said you could have all of that, but you can't have that. God, he doesn't love you. He's holding out something from you. That's what we tend to do in our marriages. God tells us to be thankful for absolutely everything. But we stop thanking him and focus on you know what you didn't do for me? You know how I feel about it? Yeah, we're selfish. That's selfishness. There is no love in that. But we've got to learn what to do with it because there is an offense there, isn't there? And when we are offended, the first thing we want to do is this. We want to accuse. I'm repeating myself on purpose, by the way. Okay? You'll hear that often. The moment you go to accuse, he's the accuser. You've just changed lords. You've just changed lords the moment you go to accuse. Now, on the cross, did Jesus defend himself? He didn't? Why didn't he? Could have. He could have easily 
come off of that cross and said, everybody believes me, stand over here. And all the ones that's going to be toast, stand over here. <laughs> and he could have proved himself to be the Son of God. He could have. Now, if you turn to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 1. It asks a rhetorical question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Remember I started off saying there's two things that cause problems. We're not in agreement. We argue. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires or your emotions that you want that you're not getting? You want the other person to either do something or to not do something. To say something or not say something. I don't want you to say that anymore. I don't want you to behave that way. I don't want you to remind me of that anymore. I don't, why don't you tell me? Why don't you hold me? Why don't you hug me? Why don't you kiss me? Why don't you be intimate with me? Why don't you? Why don't you? You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You do. You do. You do. We're accusing, accusing, accusing. It goes on to say, you want something, but you don't get it. You kill. You covet. You quarrel. You fight. You war with each other trying to get what you want. That's what the Scripture says. You war. With that person trying to get what you want. Which means you're angry. And in your anger we raise our voice. We withdraw. We don't talk. We threaten. And this is who we're submitted to during that. Because it says don't do that. It says the reason you don't have what you want is because you don't ask God. You keep asking the other person. Stop it. Don't do that. You know how I feel. Accusing. Who's the accuser? He is. And I'm his puppet right now accusing another person. I am his puppet. He's talking to me. And I'm listening to him. And I'm obeying him. And I'm accusing my spouse. This is food for thought. We don't normally think this way. Now, so the moment I go to accuse her, I'm submitted to him. Now, the number one thing that most people do when they're accused is what? Defend. Defend. So guess what she wants to do? She wants to defend herself, right? Because she doesn't want to be guilty. If she comes to accuse me, the first thing I want to do is I want to defend myself. I don't want her to think I'm guilty of something I haven't done. But that's not what Jesus did. The Scripture goes on to say, resist the devil. Because the devil wants me to accuse and the devil wants me to defend those two things. That's not what Christ did. Because the moment I defend myself, I have went into idolatry. Now let me explain that. Because if my wife is falsely accusing me, and I start to defend myself, is there someone who knows that I'm innocent? Hmm? Some, does someone know? When Christ was on the cross, who knew He was innocent? If He had come off that cross to start defending Himself, it would have been like Him saying, Father, I know that You know I'm innocent, but right now it's more important that my wife knows. Or my husband, or these people out here, they've called me Satan. I've got to prove to them that I'm not. Now, Father knows He's innocent. So it's like lifting this person up above Father God. Father is more important that they know than you know. He says, okay. If that's where you want to be. But this is not going to go well. <laughs> but that's all that we've known to do, isn't it? 
That's all that we that's the only the tool in the toolbox. You don't want to be guilty of something that you're not guilty of. Even our court system says that I am innocent till you prove me to be guilty. So prove it. And so it was like a court system in our marriage. Yes, let's say that I have hurt my wife. And she's weighing the evidence, exhibit A. He used that tone of voice. Exhibit B, he looked at me that way. Exhibit C, he just shrugged his shoulders. Exhibit D, he just walked away without talking. Exhibit E, my friends were there and she embarrassed me in our own home. So she is the prosecutor. She's going to accuse me. She's weighing the evidence in her mind and she's already found me to be guilty. Is that right? So she's coming to me to accuse me. Guess who her Lord is right now? She's joined forces over here to come to accuse me. Now, I don't want to be guilty of something that I'm not guilty of, do I? So I want to start defending myself. I want to null and void all the evidence. Isn't that what we do in an argument? Well, that's true. I did have that tone of voice with you. It is true I shrugged my shoulders. It's true I had that look on my face. But you shouldn't feel that way. I look at people like that all the time and they don't, they're not hurt like you or they're not mad like you are. And they don't come accuse me and we don't have this conversation. I have that with work all the time. I talk to people like that. And they don't get mad like you. You're just too sensitive. <laughs> this is not going to go well. I'm defending myself. And the scripture actually says, come into an agreement quickly with your accuser. Doesn't it? And I'm not. I don't want her to think I'm guilty. So I'm going to defend myself. Now what's happened here is that she submitted herself to this guy and now I've submitted myself to this guy. <laughs> this is not going to go well. She's accusing and I'm defending. So now we're fighting over whether or not I'm guilty. You know what Jesus did? He pled guilty. <laughs> he didn't focus on whether or not he was guilty. He didn't focus on whether or not it was true what they were saying. He was focusing on them being free of this guy. By his stripes, they're healed. By his stripes, they can be free. And the scripture says the same thing about us. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 20, it says this, If you suffer for doing good. I didn't know I did anything wrong. I was just having a conversation with her, with her friends. I didn't even know I raised my voice. I didn't know I had that look on my face. I didn't know that shrugging my shoulders and walking away would cause an offense. I didn't do anything wrong. But now she's in here angry, accusing me. If you suffer for doing good, what the scripture says, and you endure it. That means obeying God during it. This is commendable before God. To this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you the example to follow in His steps. Well, He was accused about anything that you can imagine. He did not come off the cross. <coughs> He did not defend himself. He was willing to take sin that did not belong to him. Are we? No. We're not. We want to be innocent. We don't want our spouse to think that we're guilty of something we haven't done. And so we want to, be, we want to defend ourselves. We want to null and void that evidence. We want to prove them to be wrong. We want to do the opposite of what the Scripture tells us to do. And that's why we're not one in that area. That's why we got another elephant on the table. That's why we got a record of wrongs. That's why we're losing intimacy. That's why we stop talking. That's why we're not having sex. That's why we don't want to be together anymore. Because we've got all this stuff that we've never settled. Because we don't know what to do with it. It goes on to say that when he was falsely accused, he did not defend himself. It says, by his stripes, we have been healed. Is that right? 
Isn't that what it says? It says, that's the example that we're to follow, that by my stripes that she's putting on me by accusing me, if I will obey God, she can be healed. Because I did not sin. Now think about this. There's an emotional trigger here. This is huge what I'm teaching you right now. This is where, we, this is where most of our fights come from. She is emotionally triggered. I didn't sin. I was just having a conversation and walked away. So why is that emotional trigger there? Because someone in her past, her mother or her father or somebody, did sin with a similar way. They sinned against her. And then smacked her, hit her, whipped her, whatever, with that face and that tone of voice, and then walked away. And so, since I have done something very similar, her conscious mind goes to her subconscious mind and says, have we felt this way before? Has somebody looked at us that way before? Had they used that tone of voice before? Did they just shrug their shoulders and walk away? It says, yes, they did. And sends those emotions into her body like little Johnny. And now she feels with me what belongs way back there to her mother or her father. It belongs way back there. It has nothing to do with me. You see, because she did not forgive, this guy's got her in that area. You see? He's got her. I want her to be free. If I defend myself, she doesn't get free. Now, let me explain something else here. You see, because she's not really mad at me, she's, she's offended with me, but I didn't sin, so I know this doesn't belong to me. So we can start to figure these things out. When your spouse is angry with you, <clears throat> you can think, did I sin? This is giving you a tool to work with. Did I sin? He's mad at me or she's mad at me. No, I didn't sin. Then it has nothing to do with me. Well, that starts to change your reaction when you know it has nothing to do with you. You don't need to defend yourself because it has nothing to do with you. Do you see this? But you're standing in the gap for the person that they're really angry with. That's what Jesus was. He was standing in the gap on the cross. He was willing to take those stripes so we could be free. Am I willing to take this stripe for her so she can be free? I know this sounds odd. It doesn't sound right. We've never been taught this. But this is our job. It says He set the example for us to follow. Now, let me just tell you another, about another law of God, then we're going to come back to this. There's, in the spiritual realm and the physical realm there's a law of uh, multiplication a law of increase when you plant one apple seed it takes a while for that little seed to sprout and it needs to come up and it may take a number of years but in a number of years you have a tree don't you and on that tree you have a multiplication you have an increase. You don't have a tree with one apple on it. You've got a tree with many apples on it, don't you? That's God's law. Well, that law is also true in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, you know, Peter came to Jesus, how many times i got to forgive this turkey? How many times? Jesus said, 70 times 7. 490. Now, that's very significant. Why 490? And the reason is this. Let's say that that person in the origin's childhood who did shrug their shoulders, looked at her that way, used that tone of voice, and hit her, called her a name or whatever, was her father. It could have been anybody. Since she did not forgive, and now I'm trying to become one with her. She can't be one with me in that area because she's still one with her father back there with that unforgiveness. I've taken her father's place. So anytime I do anything similar to her father, 
it gets transferred to me, doesn't it? It gets transferred to me. And it's vice versa. Anytime she does anything similar to my mother, it gets transferred to her. So I am now standing in the gap for her father. Am I willing to take his sin and her sin? Am I willing? Now, in the spiritual realm, if you go back and you forgive your father, because you can go back and forgive, you're done. You've wiped that out. That emotional trigger is gone. But you can also work that out in the present. Because she's going to have to forgive me many times, 490, where she didn't forgive her father one time to get free of that emotional trigger. Now she can go back and forgive her father. It doesn't come to me anymore. Or she can forgive me many, many, many times in the present and she will satisfy that curse. Do you see this? So I'm not going to focus on whether or not I'm innocent because she's coming to accuse me. I think I did not sin. This has nothing to do with me. I want her free. I want her free. This is not normally the way we think. We think I didn't do anything wrong. I've got to prove I'm innocent. Well, if you, want, if you prove that you're innocent and you argue, she's, your spouse stays here. They stay here. Because you want to use your pride and be innocent. You don't want them to think you've done anything wrong. That's the opposite of Christ on the cross. He didn't care what they thought. He cared what he thought. We've got to stop caring what our spouse and others think and care about what he thinks and be willing to take sin that doesn't belong to us so that our spouse and others can be free of this guy. Because he's got them. He's got them. He's got us. So when she comes to accuse me, or others come to accuse me, because I get accused a lot. On Sunday morning, I'm everybody's dad. <laughs> Any trigger they got comes to me. And I hear about it after the service. <laughs> I like the way you said that. <laughs> I don't do what a lot of people do. Well, this is the word of God. It's not me saying it. It's him saying it. You need to get up. No, I say, I am so sorry. Because they can put the stripe on me and they can be, I got an opportunity to help them get free of this. I am so sorry that me saying it that way, using that tone of voice, caused you to feel this way. Would you forgive me? Did I confess sin? No. I, they said what bothered them. I'm saying, I'm sorry that me saying it that way, that me doing it that way, that me having that tone of voice caused you to feel this way. Would you forgive me? And as they forgive me, they're forgiving whoever is back here that they're really angry with. The mom, the dad, the uncle, ex-husband, ex whoever. They're getting free of this. You see, if we would do this in these marriage relationships, the moment one of you gets triggered and goes to accuse, do not defend yourself. Say, why are you angry? So you know what to confess to. <laughs> so you know what to take on you so they can be free. Instead of arguing and arguing and arguing and trying to prove yourself innocent because that's pride. And that's why God hates pride the most. I don't want you to think something of me. I care more about what you think than what he thinks. He knows I'm innocent, but I want you to know I'm innocent. It doesn't go well. Because you're both submitted to the devil. Does it make sense? I know it sounds different. He knows. Yes. It works. Now, but what if when she comes to me and she says, accuses me, and I get triggered because when I was a little boy, I was always getting accused by my father. I was getting accused by the baseball coach. I was getting accused by the, by the policeman. I was getting accused, 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 accused. So when she comes to me to accuse me, and I haven't forgiven them, guess how I feel? <sighs> right? Well, it's kind of hard to stay on the cross when you've got all this in you. <laughs> so what do I do?
I've got to go forgive her for accusing me because she's standing in the gap for who I'm really angry with. <laughs> Think about this. When she came to me and says, I'm hurt, even though she submitted to him, did I sin? No, I didn't. She's not mad at me. But I'm now triggered because someone back there accused me, accused me, accused me, and she's standing in the gap for them. As I forgive her, I'm working in the harvest field. 49, 487, 486, 485. You see this. So when she comes to accuse me, and I go lose my peace, I'll say, I'll be back in a few minutes, and I'll say one of two things. I'm going to go pray about this before I respond, or I'm going to go for a walk, and I'll be back in a few minutes. And I go do what I said I'm going to do. So I go to the other room. Or I usually go outside. I don't want her to even hear me because I'm mad. I've been wrongfully accused. This is not justice. So I walk outside where she can't even hear me. Because it's not a sin to be angry, is it? What you do with it makes it a sin. If I start defending myself, I'm in sin. If I come back and say, well, what about you? <laughs> From the record of wrongs. You come to talk, talk to accuse me about this, but what about you? Now we've got two people accusing each other. So I walk outside. And I'm mad. I've got a tightness in my stomach. and I've got my fist all balled up. <clears throat> Lord Jen, I forgive you. Now she doesn't, she's inside, I'm outside. You know, the thought word doesn't mean much, do you know that? There's not much power in the thought word. It's the spoken word. Before he created the earth, he thought it and spoke it into existence. It tells you how much power is in the spoken word. So I don't think forgiveness, I speak forgiveness. Lord Jen, I forgive you. I forgive you for coming and accusing me of something and I didn't do anything wrong. Just trying to have a conversation. Just having, trying to talk to you. Just trying to have a conversation. I forgive you that every time we have this conversation, you get offended with me. I forgive you that you get embarrassed. I forgive you that you go tell your, your, your friends and I forgive you that they all pray for me. <laughs> I forgive you for this problem that just keeps on and on and on. And I release you of it in Jesus' name. Whew, anger, go. 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 Tightness in my stomach, go. Pressure in my jaw, go. Now what is these emotions I'm feeling? These emotions I'm feeling is from way back there where I didn't forgive when I was accused. You see? She's taking their place. I'm working in the harvest field. I don't know who it is back there I haven't forgiven. But she's standing in the gap. And as I forgive her, I'm getting free. Now, I'm at peace. Resist the devil. I've done that. Submit yourself to God. I'm doing that. Do not slander one another. Who who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in on judgment. There's only one lawgiver and only one judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? I want to transfer this to him. This does not belong to me. It belongs to Him. You know, it's not up to me to settle this with her. It's up to Him to settle it with her. She is His daughter. I can discuss this with her and it causes a problem. He can talk to her about it and we're still one. She feels convicted. We're not taught to get God involved in our relationships to this depth. That's why I don't go to her and accuse her. 
I, can, I forgive her and go to Him. I want Him to talk to her. When I'm not getting from her what I want, I resist this guy who says, go accuse her. Tell her what you want. Tell her what you're not getting. Tell her she needs to make a change. Be angry with her. Resist the devil. It says you don't have what you want because you don't ask God. We keep asking each other and blaming each other and finding fault with each other, trying to get from the other person what we want. And we're submitted to the devil, both of us, and don't even realize it. How many people do you think make a heartfelt change because someone's angry with them? They'll make a change to avoid your wrath and your anger, but that's not a heartfelt change. She will change if I accuse her and I'm mad at her enough and I threaten to leave her and divorce her. She'll change. But it's not a heartfelt change. It's just to avoid my wrath. But that's the only tool that we've had. That's all that we've known to do. That's what's been demonstrated to us over and over and over by the world and TV and our parents. Everyone. So we just use that's the only tool we got is our anger and our threats and not talking and separating. That's all that we've known to do. So she's come to me and she's accused me. I went outside and forgave her because it got into my stuff. Now I want to go to God. You don't have what you ask because you don't ask God. I want to transfer it to the rightful owner. I'm going to do what Jesus did on the cross. I'm going to be willing to take sin that doesn't belong to me and I'm going to transfer it to the rightful owner. But the Father, I have forgiven her. I don't know who she's really angry with because I didn't sin. I don't know who she's angry with, but I'm willing to take that. Whew. I'm willing to take it so she can be free. Whoa. This is a different way of handling issues, isn't it? I'm willing to take it so she can be free. I didn't sin. I want her to be free of this. Now I'm at peace and I come back into Lord Jim and I said, Sweetheart, would you tell me again why you're angry with me? I want to make sure that I plead guilty right. <laughs> you know, when you're in the court system, remember we talked about the court system. This is just like a court system. The prosecutor came in. She weighed the evidence. In front of the witnesses, and says, I found you to be guilty. And I said, recess. <laughs> Let me go think about this. And I went and forgave. But in a court system, when the man pleads guilty, is there any argument over the evidence? No. So if I come back in and plead guilty, what are we going to argue about? <laughs> what are we going to argue about? I come back and I say, sweetheart, I am so sorry that I used that tone of voice when I was talking to you. I'm sorry that I had that look on my face. I'm sorry that I shrugged my shoulders in front of your friends that I embarrassed you so much. Would you forgive me for that? What do you think she'd say? What would you say? That's because she, I'm asking to forgive. I'm not trying to defend myself and prove my innocence and trying to put it back on her. Most likely she'll say, yes, I forgive you. And it's very important that she says the words, I forgive you. Because she, she might say, well, that's just okay. No, it's not okay. She needs to forgive me. And I said, sweetheart, that's not okay. I hurt you, and that's not okay. Will you forgive me? Or she could go into the record of wrongs. Say, well, you know what? You know what? 
You did the same thing two weeks ago. And you did the same thing three months ago. And this is so you just keep doing this over and over. Sweetheart, I thank you that you brought this to my attention. I didn't realize that I was doing that. I didn't realize that it would hurt you. How could I realize it? I'm not sinning. <laughs> you see? Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I want her free of those record of wrongs. Because she's over here with those record of wrongs. I want her free of this guy. I'm sorry that I did that three weeks ago. Will you forgive me? I'm sorry that I did it a month ago. Would you forgive me? I am so sorry. I love you, darling. I don't want you hurt like this. I don't want you angry with me like this. I don't want to cause a problem between us. Would you like for me to go to your friends and ask them to forgive me also? I don't mind doing that. Humility. Humility. I might need to go to her father. I need to go to her. Because she might have went and showed, told her mother. She might have told her father. And they're angry with me too. Will I be humble and go ask them to forgive me also for hurting her daughter? All I say is none of their business. They need to get out of it. Or what? You shouldn't have told your mom. You shouldn't have told your dad. I may have to go forgive her for telling her mom and dad. Because I'm not going to go accuse her for doing it. Because if I go accuse her, where am I at? I'm in hell on earth. I've changed lords. So I may have to go forgive her for telling her mother, for telling her father, for sharing it with the prayer group. <laughs> we need to pray for my husband. <laughs> Because if you, if you love someone and they're hurt, you're hurt. So her father may be hurt, her mother may be hurt, her friends may be hurt. And I may need to go to them and ask them to forgive me also. It's all about humility and knowing what to do. It's about love. I'm going to sacrifice my right to be right. I'm going to sacrifice my right to be innocent. And when I sacrifice my right to be right, my right to be innocent, and ask to be forgiven for things that I haven't even done so she can be free, God sends His love through that sacrifice to her. She says, yes, I forgive you. And her heart opens up to me. You see this. And we're one again in that area. 